from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. I'm Daniel Bumhar. I'm the head of reader services here in the music division at the Library of Congress. And I want to um, warn you in advance that the talk I'm going to give is um, if you ever wondered what it would be like to hear an academic paper given by a musicologist, this is your chance. But I also know that our concert audience is a very sophisticated audience and will have no problem keeping up with the arcane details that I will, uh, well, will kind of subject you to. And also, one of the things that I think is really um, a great opportunity, you know, having a concert series and this fantastic concert hall and the series we present here at the Library of Congress in a library is a fairly unique thing. And what most of our concert audience may miss in this process is the fact that there's one of the greatest libraries in the world surrounding you during this process. And concerts are how we in the music division make our collections come to life. But research in our collections is really the sort of backbone of what we do. And this is an opportunity, I hope, to kind of show you what the collections here enable in terms of uh, the kind of information that we can glean about music history and uh, music culture in previous centuries, as you will soon see. Um, so tonight's concert features Mahan Esfahani with music of the Bach family, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach and Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, as well as Carl Philippe Emanuel Bach. There are also two pieces of 20, 20th century composers on the program tonight. The, um, the concert tonight is part of uh, a two-event uh, series, so to speak, focusing on the mu music of Carl Philippe Emanuel Bach, who was born 300 years ago in Weimar, Germany. To the extent that he is known today, C.P. Bach is primarily remembered as one of several sons of Johann Sebastian Bach, possibly also remembered as the author of a treatise on the keyboard. And there is the chance that an average concert goer has heard some of C.P. Bach's music. Yet in his own day, the fame of Carl Philippe Emanuel Bach far exceeded that of his father. And in fact, the music collection here at the Library of Congress reflects the interest in C.P.E. Bach's music that remained strong throughout the 19th and early 20th century. The story of the C.P.E. Bach sources at the Library of Congress consists of several different threads, each spun out of the interests and motivations of musicians and collectors over nearly 300 years. As a whole, this collection of C.P.E. Bach materials documents the acquisition practices and strategies of a fledgling American research library at the beginning of the 20th century. At the same time, separate groupings of materials help to fill out a picture of 18th century performance history in Northern Europe and documents the music collecting of individuals in the 19th century. Besides the 85 examples at the Library of Congress of Bach's music printed during his lifetime, the collection includes one autograph manuscript of a single keyboard Fantasia, and that's on display in the foyer of the Coolidge Auditorium. There are also three autograph letters, and in my opinion, most interestingly, our holdings include 74 copyist manuscripts and five more that are misattributed to Bach. And these offer evidence of how individuals within and beyond CPE Bach's immediate circle of colleagues engaged with the composer's music. So tonight I will attempt to do two things in this brief introduction to a noteworthy portion of the library's music collections. First, I'll explain how this rich collection of C.P. Bach materials came to be held here at the Library of Congress. Then I will describe how these materials reflect 18th and 19th century musical life, particularly in Berlin. In doing this, I will risk, like I said, presenting an abundance of scholarly detail because 
in part, I know our concert audience will appreciate such information, but also because I want to offer evidence of the kind of research that the collections here at the library support. Tomorrow evening, I will be joined by two of the editors of the complete works of C.P. Bach to discuss the composer's music in further detail and to explore the process by which a scholarly edition of music is prepared. On about August 1st, 1902, Oscar Sonic began his duties as the second chief of the music division at the Library of Congress. He would conduct his initial work while in Europe, armed with letters of introduction to European libraries and book dealers from the ambitious Librarian of Congress, Herbert Putnam. Putnam had served as the Librarian of Congress since April of 1899 and had embarked on a mission proposed in 1896 by him and nine other witnesses before the Joint Congressional Committee on the Library of Congress. At, in those recommendations, they proposed to create something more than a repository of copyright records or a legislative library, but a true national library. Sonic embraced Putnam's charge. I want to show you. Here's a picture of uh, Oscar Sonic. He's the um, short fellow in the very center of the front row. Um, he was fairly young. I think he was under 40 when he was appointed Librarian of Congress. Um, and then he is surrounded by the um, division chiefs of the library at that time. Oscar Sonic is pictured in this on uh, in the second row, and I'm gonna um, point to him directly because it's hard to explain because the rows aren't quite as clear as you would hope. I say that's second from the right on in the second row, but it's hard to tell. Anyways, Sonic was, I believe, um, hardly 30 when he was appointed the chief of the music division. Um, so Sonic embraced Putnam's charge and sought to, quote, provide a reasonably comprehensive collection of all material bearing in any way on music in America, and more particularly, on American music. In this, Sonic held the view, as described by him in 1908, that, quote, American music as the product of American brains and American industry is deemed to be of paramount importance in our national library. Yet the peculiar development and status of music in America, being mainly a reflex of music in Europe, compel the Library of Congress to collect the musical product of European brains and industry in the same manner as European libraries do or would like to do. Sonic further stated, beginning with the 18th century, and he, in his article, adds emphasis, the Library of Congress aims at a collection of music and books on music sufficiently comprehensive to ultimately relieve the American scholar of the necessity of consulting European libraries, except for research not bearing directly or indirectly on music in America as a reflex of music in Europe. Later in the same essay, Sonic observes a result of this strategy. Quote, the Library of Congress collection is growing rapidly into something really useful to the historian, and we already possess quite a few things, particularly in manuscript or of English imprint, that are not frequently found. We appear to have, for instance, some symphonies by that master of strange Epicurean tastes, Anton Filtz, not mentioned in Hugo Riemann's bibliography. We have about 30 of the 45 Cembalo concertos of C.P.E. Bach, and we were able to supply some of Haydn's unpublished divertimenti to the editors of the complete edition of his works, now in process of publication. In building the collection at the Library of Congress, Sonic sought to make available a comprehensive reference collection of the literature about music and the existing musical repertory. In this, he would, in general, only acquire a single copy of a composition, even if additional variant manuscript sources might become available. And he seems to have been willing to delay the purchase of printed editions in order to take advantage of the availability of manuscripts of unpublished works that presumably would be far more scarce. In any event, we have in the Music Division collections an annotated copy of the 
um, 1905's thematic catalog of CPE Box works, which demonstrates the comprehensiveness of the efforts of successive generations of staff at the Library of Congress to collect this composer's music. And it's obvious because it's annotated with the things we have and the things that we don't have. Interestingly, the existing collection of CPE Bach materials has attained a relevance that Sonic might not ever have imagined. With the publishing of the complete works of CPE Bach well underway, which we will discuss here tomorrow evening, access to this music will no longer present the challenge it did in the early 20th century, and scholarship can now more successfully consider the music in the broader context of 18th century life. And in fact, a growing body of scholarship seeks to contextualize Bach's compositions, not only musically, but also within society. In this research, the non-autograph manuscript sources offer a lens onto the musical interests and practices of previous centuries, and the manuscript musical sources at the Library of Congress offer entree into musical and social settings that often lack documentation in other contemporary accounts. In the early years of the 20th century, one specific Berlin antiquarian book dealer played an essential role in making it possible for the Library of Congress to acquire the collection we now possess of C.P. Bach's music. The firm Leo Liebmannson operated under its founder's name from 1874 until 1936. However, in 1903, at about the time that the Library of Congress began buying from the firm, Liebmannson sold the company to a young colleague by the name of Otto Haas. From Haas and the Liebmann's own firm, the Library of Congress acquired 18th century C.P. Bach materials stemming from a handful of important 19th century collections. Tonight I want to focus on one of these 19th century collections, that of Edward Grell, a Berlin composer, conductor, organist, teacher, and director, director of the Berlin Zing Academy from 1853 to 1876. This collection, as I will discuss, has deep roots in Berlin musical life in the 18th century. The items from Grell's collections generally bear a cipher. This is an item from that collection. They bear a cipher in pencil containing the letters GR, and you can see that towards the um, top of the manuscript. It's, in, it's fairly faint in pencil. And it, this GR is usually followed by a three or four digit number. The GR numbering was seemingly added in preparation for the sale of the music collection, Grell's music collection, by Liebman Zone uh, following Grell's death in 1886. The significance of the GR numbers remains entirely elusive, though. The numbers do not refer to the numbering in Liebman Zone's sales catalogs and appear on items that origin originated not just in Grell's collection, but also on items from the collections of another Berlin, two other Berlin musicians, Franz Komer, and also possibly Wilhelm von Radern, whose music collections were sold by Liebmann's own alongside of Grell's collection. In fact, in some instances, the presence of a GR number on items with Franz Komer's owner's mark have led individuals to presume that Grell acquired those items from Komer. That Grell died in 1886, and Comer died in 1887 would at least preclude the possibility that Grell acquired items from the estate of Comer, though. Rather, the frequent addition in pencil, and I have, uh, so the frequent addition in pencil of the time signature and key signatures on title pages, as seen very, very faintly in this example. This is a sonata uh, manuscript of a uh, trio sonata by Johann Gottlieb Graun. Um, and so you can see on the um, right hand middle third of the um, page H and then a lowercase m and then 4 slash 4. That refers to ha mol and the time signature of 4 4. Ha mol would be German for B minor. Um, It'd take a long time to explain how H got to be used for B, but um, so this numbering or this additional information, the key signature and uh, and time signature, conforms with the descriptive practices found in Liebmann's own catalogs, 
And it, because of this, it seems most likely that someone working at Liebman's Own on the sale of these collections applied the GR numbers indiscriminately to Grell's materials as well as Comer and possibly von Radern's. While occasionally objects from Grell's collection also bear a stamp with Grell's name, the, a modern uh, Bach scholar, the current director of the Bach Archive in Leipzig, Peter Volney, has observed that a different marking might allow one to distinguish items from Grell's collection. Most manuscripts presumed to be from Grell's collection have a consistent numbering pattern where the abbreviation NO appears in the lower center to right-hand side of the title pages, followed by a two or three digit number and a period. The distinctive cursive script of the capital N easily distinguishes these number, this numbering scheme. Does everybody see that at the bottom of the page there? Based on the evidence at the Library of Congress, I believe that Volney has correctly identified this numbering scheme as in fact Grell's own personal numbering scheme. Born in Berlin in 1800 into a musical family, Edward Grell studied composition with Carl Friedrich Zelter and Carl Friedrich Rungenhagen, who were successive directors of the Zing Academy in Berlin. In 1829, he began teaching at what, what would become the Royal Institute of Church Music and held the position of organist at the Berlin Cathedral from 1839, prior to which he had served from the age of 18 as organist at St. Nikolai Church in Berlin. In 1853, Grell succeeded his teacher Rungenhagen as director of the famous Berlin Zing Academy. Until recently, Grell's work had, had not garnered significant attention since shortly after his death. His student Heinrich Bellermann produced two substantial publications in the eight, late 1880s, a biography and a collection of Grell's essays. These two publications place great emphasis on Grell's promotion of a cappella vocal music and in particular on compositions in the style of Palestrina. The abundance of instrumental music from Grell's collection now held at the Library of Congress would, however, seem to challenge the image of Grell promoted among his followers, that of a pure one specifically and almost um, solely devoted to this idea of a cappella palestrina-like uh, vocal music. Um, and that, so Bellarmon's uh, sort of image of Grell um, was what gained traction. However, I think this large amount of 18th century manuscript material of instrumental music sort of contradicts that notion. While the significance of Grell's Bach collection has received passing mention by scholars with particular reference to the need for more study of it, the enormity and broad scope of his entire music collection remains unconsidered. The C.P. Bach manuscripts here at the Library of Congress that can be confidently linked to Grell's collection cons consist of three groups of materials. There are six concertos, of which three are misattributed to C.P. Bach, two choral compositions, and 11 trio sonatas. Following Grell's death, a French collector by the name of Lazare appears to have purchased the concertos and trio sonatas from Grell's collection through Liebmann's own in about 1889. They came to the Library of Congress in 1907, again through the agency of Liebmann's own. Two manuscripts of C.P. Bach's vocal compositions that come from Grell's collection came to the Library of Congress in a large purchase, again from Liebmann's own, this time in the year 1908. This was a large collection of vocal music um, that belonged to Julius Stockhausen, the singer and close colleague of Johannes Brahms. Stockhausen presumably also acquired these manuscripts, the C.P. Bach manuscripts, from the 1889 sale, Liebmann's own sale of Grell's collection. In no instance in the Library of Congress manuscripts is Grell's numbering, that N.O. pattern at the bottom of the page, in no instance is Grell's numbering struck through. However, Grell's numbering scheme appears to replace an earlier scheme found in the upper right-hand corner, sometimes more than one numbering scheme, as you can see in this instance. And that's particularly evident in the trio sonatas of C.P. Bach's music. Um, 
The canceled numbering scheme is also present in at least 32 other manuscripts of trio sonatas of 18th century Berlin origin that are held here at the Library of Congress. This is one more example. It's a trio sonata uh, by um, Johann Philipp Kiernberger. And you can see in the upper right that 217 is crossed out. As seen as elsewhere in this group of manuscripts, this being one good example, the CPE Bach items bear clear indication that the individual that numbered the items or had the numbers item, uh, items numbered in the upper right-hand corner had acquired or commissioned items in groups. This is exhibited because there are successive groupings of items in the hand of differing copyists. So five manuscripts in the hand of one copyist, another five or six in the hand of another copyist. So it would seem that whoever owned these before Grell, excuse me, acquired a chunk of manuscripts and then acquired another and another, and they are numbered sequentially. So you can see one group of manuscripts and then the numbering um, flows right into the next group, which is completely distinct, it's different copies, and it's on different paper. So. One fairly consistent characteristic among all of these trio sonata manuscripts that indicates the relationship between these sonatas, in addition to this consistent numbering scheme in the upper right hand corner, is the recurring presence of materials in the hand of, or that, that in some way can be linked with an individual by the name of Johann Friedrich Herring. Herring, as you can see, signed his name at the bottom right hand corner of this manuscript. Herring was, uh, maintained close contact with C.P. Bach. Um, in addition to this, he served as an agent uh, in the sale of C.P. Bach's publications after Bach had moved from Berlin in 1768 to Hamburg. Herring also appears to have served as a private music teacher in Berlin. He himself uh, would collect and copy for his own collection um, sophisticated repertoire uh, but the Peabody Conservatory professor, Andrew Talley, has documented that Herring prepared manuscripts of simpler repertoire, presumably for students. Otherwise, little else is known about Herring or the extent of the collection of music he amassed for himself rather than on commission. A numbering sequence found on the lower left-hand side of the C.P. Bach manuscripts of the trio sonatas here at the library appears to be in Herring's hand and offers one indication that these items comprise a portion of Herring's personal collection. So it's numbered number 10 in the bottom right in parentheses, I'm sorry, bottom left in parentheses uh, under the musical in Chippet. If the numbering scheme on the lower left is Herring's, the numbering in the upper right would presumably represent an intermediate owner between Herring and Grell. In the instance of the C.P. Bach manuscripts at the Library of Congress, the practice of preparing manuscripts for students may converge with Herring's own personal practice of copying highly sophisticated music of, Bach's, of the Bach family for his own collection. Herring's students included an individual by the name of Otto von Foss, a member of a well-established noble Prussian family, and eventually a prominent official in the Prussian government during the late 18th and early 19th century. He was for about a year or two in um, during the Napoleonic Wars, the, uh, the prime minister of Prussia um, under Friedrich Wilhelm III but he didn't um, necessarily agree with his king very well. So it was a short-lived relationship. Um, Otto von Foss built an, in his free time, uh, built a noteworthy music collection that in part supported an active musical salon in Berlin during the first decade of the 19th century. His son, Otto von Foss Jr., continued to refine, expand, and catalog the collection. In a study of the von Foss collection, the German scholar Bettina Faustik elaborates on the relationship of Herring with this noble family, noting that a member of the Foss family served as a witness to Herring's last will and testament dated September 18, sorry, September 1810. And in addition to this, a significant body of material in the Foss collection came from Herring's estate. 
Edward Grell's possession of Herring's manuscripts may reflect that the Foss family manuscripts later came into the collection of the Zing Academy, though there's no concrete evidence of this. There are a lot of similarities between the Foss collection and um, material that is found in the Zing Academy collection that was only recently rediscovered in Kiev, of all places. Um, so, along these same lines, I'd like to discuss another collection of manuscripts that may also have comprised a portion of Grell's collection, and prior to that, possibly of Foss's collection. This is an example, actually, before I move on. This is an example of Herring's um, musical hand. It's a fairly, actually, you stare at these pages for long enough, and they either become extremely distinct or look all the same. Um, but uh, this is a this is a fairly good example of Herring's hand, and I don't think anyone would be confused about it. We have other manuscripts, though, these this 50-some trio sonatas that um, all came from Grell's collection. I, um, again, you stare at these long enough and you can't tell heads or tails of anything, but it really appears that even in items that aren't in Herring's hand, they have his continuo figurations, these numbers above the bass line here, which are for the um, chords to be played above the music. Um, it really looks like Herring's hand, but you know, if we got 20 people to all write sixes and fives and sevens and um, flat signs and sharp signs and natural signs, I'm sure we would all start to confuse all 20 of our numbers as well. So um, I'm, I'm inclined to think that most of these manuscripts were uh, emanated from either Herring, uh, Herring's collection or were works that Herring was um, selling, uh, like he sold printed music. And anyway, event. Um, this is an example of another group of materials that I want to talk about. Um, in these instant, in this material, there are none of the telltale indicators of Grell's ownership, that NO and a number, not here, nor of uh, what I think is presumably a sign of the Foss family's ownership. So there's numbers in the upper right hand corner. There are no small numbers in the upper right hand corner. Um, at the same time, these manuscripts do display yet a different consistent numbering scheme, strikingly rendered in dark black ink with a thickly drawn N followed by successive numbers. And you can see that right after the title concerto in G. The numbering appears to restart with different composers and different genres by the same composer. Among the CPE Bach concerto manuscripts bearing this distinctive numbering sequence, two different groups appear. The first group reflects the work of several professional Berlin copyists closely associated with C.P. Bach. And even though they're closely associated with C.P. Bach, we absolutely have no idea of their identity and they continue to be referred to in Bach scholarship as Anonymous 302 and Anonymous 303. Those are largely arbitrarily assigned numbers. Um, Again, I could go on for a while about how they got to be 302 and 303, but for all intents and purposes, they're arbitrary. Another Berlin copyist, identified as F. Baumann, F. Period, Baumann, also appears consistently among this uh, first group of manuscripts. Um, and this, in fact, this title page is in the hand of F. Baumann. Again, all we know of this guy is that his name, his first initial is F, and his last name was Baumann. Um, there is a second group of uh, concerto manuscripts, music of C.P. Bach, that also fall into this numbering sequence. The second group reflects, at least in part, the work of amateur copyists working under the supervision of a copyist referenced by the scholar Rachel Wade as copyist K. Again, an entirely arbitrarily assigned uh, in, in, moniker for this copyist. The groupings become discernible not only by the presence of specific copyists, so we've got our professional copyists on the one hand, and then these amateur copyists on the other, but they also have um, consistent paper that's used in the two uh, groupings. 
Additional manuscripts of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France from Lazare's collection also bear the same numbering pattern, as well as at least one in the collection of the Berlin Zing Academy. In the earlier of the two groups, the group of concerto manuscripts that were uh, prepared by the professional copyists, uh, specifically Anonymous 302, um, there, so Anonymous 302 is sort of consistently present in these, and he is an individual who worked for Bach between 1745 and 1759. That Anonymous 302 produced many of these manuscripts offers strong evidence for the dating of the items, so they couldn't have been prepared before 1745 or after 1759. In addition, he and his fellow copyists used a paper for these manuscripts shown to date from the 1740s and perhaps from the early 1750s. Finally, the scholar and keyboard player David Schulenberg has observed that the versions of the concertos contained in the manuscripts produced by Anonymous 302 document intermediate versions of the compositions that date to about 755, 1755. And it was at this time that Bach was continuing to revise these concertos. So the versions of these concertos that are here in the Library of Congress collection are not the final form that the concertos would take. Regardless of the inconsistencies between these two groups of manuscripts, not only their sequential numbering, but also their subsequent transmission clearly reflect their integrity as a cohesive collection. Leo Liebmanzone's catalog number 75, which was published in 1889, listed these manuscripts as components of lot number 96, and that would appeared on page four of this catalog. The items correspond not only in description to the items held at the Library of Congress, these manuscripts also bear the exact numbering in Liebman's own catalog. Small notes in the upper left-hand corner of several of the Bach manuscripts reflect the numbering of the separate manuscripts li listed in Liebman's own catalog. So though Liebman's own numbering of the manuscripts does not maintain the earlier numbering pattern, so in this instance, number eight is now numbered four. You can see it faintly in the upper left-hand corner. There's just a four and a period. Um, the grouping of these manuscripts together by Liebman's own and his sales catalog uh, indicate an obvious cohesiveness. The lack of individual pricing for the manuscripts listed for sale as a group, um, and they were priced as at 60 marks for, I think it was about 12 manuscripts um, in 1889. So that suggests that Liebman's own sold these as one single lot at that time. This I know you can't. Well, I don't want to say you know. You definitely cannot see this in this photo. But there, on the library's manuscripts, um, these in particular, there's a very faint oval-shaped stamp. It's in uh, purple ink, and that's how we know that this collector, this French collector by the name of Lazare, later owned these manuscripts. Um, and other materials from Lazare's collection are held at Harvard, and I think there are some at Berkeley. There are definitely some at the Bibliothèque Nationale. All of those, the stamp, oh, and University of Michigan, um, the stamp is very clearly present. So it seems that the Library of Congress scratched off the stamp after it had acquired the items. Why? I don't know. Um, however, Lazare's collection was sold in 1907, and it was at that time that this group of 12 or so manuscripts that were sold as one lot in 1889 were dispersed. Um, and so the faint traces of the collector's stamp on our manuscripts suggest that Lazare acquired these at the 1889 sale, but that subsequently several manuscripts that match those at the Library of Congress but were turned down by Oscar Sonic, became incorporated into the holdings of the Bibliothèque Nationale. Despite the abundant information about their 19th century owners, the individuals who originally placed the distinctive numbering on these Bach concertos, and as well as a group of C.P. Bach sonatas, left no trace of his or her identity. However, another group of concertos at the Library of Congress may offer evidence of the origins of these materials. This group, again displaying the distinctive numbering pattern, this is an example of it. So here we have N4 in the top right-hand corner. 
They display this consistent numbering pattern. Um, they contain keyboard concertos by an individual named Christian Friedrich Schale. He was a Berlin contemporary of C.P. Bach's and a colleague of Bach's in Frederick the Great's uh, court orchestra. No copyist or watermarks, um, well, I don't think the copyists are water, I know the watermarks are not consistent between these Schala manuscripts and the Bach manuscripts. I'm not sure about the copyists because I can't tell if this is Balmain or not. Um, in any event, there doesn't seem to be the strong correlation between the Schala manuscripts and the Bach manuscripts. The only consistent trace of relationship between these manuscripts is the numbering scheme. Despite the lack of any discernible physical evidence left by their earliest owners, the presence of Shala's music among these items offers a revealing glimpse into the vibrant musical cult life cultivated in private societies in which Shala maintained a prominent role. He was both a member of a group known as the Musik Umbinde, sorry, Musik Umbinde Gesellschaft, um, which translates to Music Practicing Society, and also as the director, this is in the um, 1750s, 60s, and 70s, he was the director of the Musikalische Assemblée, or the Musical Assembly, comprised of his colleagues. Uh, in both instances, most of the members of these uh, societies were also members of, the, of Frederick the Great's court orchestra. Bach was not a member of any of these societies, but maintained close contact with the musicians involved in them and his music enjoyed frequent performance in these settings. The presence among these manuscripts of two of Bach's primary copyists from this period legitimates their authority and suggests that they were prepared at Bach's behest or on commission for use in Berlin, where they remained until late in the 19th century. So important information has begun to emerge about these and related materials through composer-centered research and especially in the work of the editors of the complete works of Carl Philippe Emanuel Bach. What is of particular interest to me is what these sources reveal when placed within the context of their origin and dissemination, as they offer insight not only into the professional connections CPE Bach maintained in Berlin, but also give evidence how these musicians used the composer's music as a public music culture developed in the waning years of the 18th century. Given both its extraordinary breadth and depth, the collection that Oscar Sonic built here at the Library of Congress has, as he had hoped, created the opportunity for substantive historical research in the United States. However, given the important connections this collection holds with sources held at many other institutions, rather than freeing American scholars from a reliance on European libraries, Scholarship utilizing our collection continues to strengthen the bonds of the Library of Congress to its counterparts in Europe. Given that our weekend's concerts are co-sponsored by the Goethe Institute and the German Foreign Office, I can't think of a better way to conclude my remarks than in making this observation. So I thank you for joining us here at the Library of Congress for this evening's concert, and I would be happy to respond to observations you may have. And now that you've had a taste of a musicological paper, I can only wait to see you all at the meetings of the American Musicological Society. Dan, I have a question for you. So, yes. Does the library possess the uh, any manuscripts from the most famous of the Bach copyists, Anonymous Four? <laughs> so you all heard of Anonymous Four? Well, Anonymous IV was a composer working in uh, 13th century Paris. So he, Anonymous IV was definitely not associated with C.P. Bach. <laughs> oh, and there's a great vocal female vocal ensemble in the United States today by the name of Anonymous IV. one musical manuscript and three letters. It's a, a Fantasia, um, and I am sorry to say I don't know in what key I can give you the thematic catalog number, which is 61 slash <laughs> three. Um, 
but that was it's interesting because cp Bach's kind of signature musical style was sort of improvisational music and the fantasia is is sort of the hallmark of that so it's it's a particularly nice example it's on display here in the lobby and um actually not even late in life but actually about halfway through um cp box life his handwriting became very shaky and it's very evident in this manuscript it's um, like he was uh writing on a bouncing buggy or something when he was cutting this would be a late i would say it's from the um it's someone knows i don't personally but i would say it 84 1784 or after there you go yeah oh th thank you um this might be a little left field but could you talk about the relationship between leipzig and and berlin and you said kiev was a little bit well so out of there but there were publishers that published in the late 19th century it out of both leipzig and uh, kiev and Bayleaf uh, publish, publishers. Right. So, do, you, do you know about this, and can you speak to this? Well, I, yes. So the Kiev piece of this puzzle is um, purely the result of 20th century geopolitics. The um, Russian army occupied uh, the northeast quadrant of Berlin, in which the um, Berlin, uh, well, at that time, the Prussian State Library um, existed and still exists on um, Unter den Linden, uh, and it's immediately adjacent to the Berlin University. Um, and the next building over on Unter den Linden going east is the Zing Academy building. The Zing Academy collection was um, housed in the um, Prussian State Library, um, but then all of the holdings of the Prussian State Library during the bombing raids were um, moved to mines, various mines in Germany. Um, some of them were in the Western zone um, and came into the Allies' hands, uh, and those were generally returned to Germany. Um, the ones in the Eastern zones were generally um, retained by the occupying force. And the Zing Academy collection um, was presumed lost for decades until in 1999, it was revealed to be held in Kiev. That's the only reason Kiev factors into the story. Um, but the, um, actually, so that's 20th century, 19th century, um, Leipzig was the center of, of music publishing um, period. And um, that is where CP box music was being published primarily in the 19th century. Um, Johannes Brahms edited CP box music. He owned CP back autograph manuscripts. Um, but the and book publishing was always was strong very much in the 18th century in Leipzig. But musically, um, the the sort of poles in northern Germany were first and foremost Dresden, and then um, kind of in imitation of Dresden, Frederick the Great developed his musical establishment in Berlin. So in the latter half of the 18th century, um, it was only in the latter half of the 18th century that there was any musical life to speak of in Berlin. Um, if you could please wait for the microphone so we can make sure we hear your questions. Could you say something about the uh, type of paper that these are on, and ha has it been uh, undergone any modern conservation e efforts? So, uh, yes. Um, the paper is, it's all um, it, manufactured paper, mass-produced paper, is a phenomenon of the 19th century. So all of this is um, what... Uh, actually, I was dying to say something about all of these hipsters uh, in this photo. So they're um, people who dress like this today would um, be very thrilled to be craft paper makers. Um, but the uh, just like they make craft beer, um, the uh, 
handmade paper is uh, essentially it's um, rag paper. It's uh, linen, cotton, um, and it's the fibers are um, dissolved into this kind of gelatinous ooze, and then it's poured over a screen. Um, and in the screens, paper makers would weave their, um, it's a wire screen um, that looks not very dissimilar from a window screen today, a metal, not the nylon things. Um, and into the screens would be woven a, often a um, decorative figure that would be sort of a trademark of a paper mill. And it's a, it is a watermark. So the, the watermarks that you see in your copier paper, your fancy copier paper, are purely an imitation of this um, earlier practice. And so that's how you can distinguish these different kinds of papers. The um, on, only when, the only reason conservation is generally needed on this kind of paper is when there's corrosion from the ink um, so uh, inks were usually um, contained some sort of um, iron in them, and the more iron there is, the more likely oxidation will cause the ink to, um, to erode the paper or corrode the paper. Um, otherwise, this paper is stunningly strong, and um, it survives in much better shape than 19th century and 20th century paper. Um, so you'll see there are numerous examples, and everything on display in the foyer is 18th century uh, printed editions or manuscripts, so it's all inherently 18th century paper, and they're in stunningly good condition. I was just curious about the cost of the uh, purchase in the purchasing of these manuscripts. You mentioned 60 marks, but I don't know how much that is, or in today's marketplace, and how valuable right. they might be in the marketplace today, so, an auction or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, it. <laughs> we always shy away from talking about money, because um, the collections here are, if we were to buy them today, would in would be shockingly expensive. Um, and um, the, uh, but not across the board, but even then, like a copious manuscript of a CP Bach concerto would not be shockingly expensive. Um, shockingly expensive in my mind, depending on the music, is six or seven figures. Um, and there's definitely music that sells for that. Um, the, uh, two years ago, or about a year ago, um, a copy of the Goldberg Variations, which was published, one of the few pieces published during J.S. Bach's lifetime, um, sold at auction for a record for a printed piece of music, and I want to say it was 209,000 um, pounds. So that would be around $300,000. Um, but that's the Goldberg Variations, and that's J.S. Bach. Um, and there are about... I don't know, maybe 30 copies of the Goldberg variations that survive in the original printed edition. Um, C.P. Bach, I don't know. I'm sure we could find examples of um, things sold recently. I would think that a contemporary printed edition, depending on what it was, would be in the neighborhood of um, maybe eight to $15,000. Manuscripts, it's a totally different ball game, but it doesn't mean that the numbers are going to be significantly different. It's just, um, you know, something's worth what someone's willing to pay for it. Any other questions? Well, thank you for indulging me. <laughs> the, uh, um, like I said, it was kind of detailed material that I was laying on you. Um, I hope you found the part of the notion of building the collections here at the library to be interesting, at the very least. So thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.